Welcome back to the Aussie Shed, ladies and gentlemen. In this episode, we'll look further into setting up the carriage lead screw, a little bit more work on the cross slide, and we'll have a bit of an in-depth look into the compound and just see what the hell's going on with it. So stay tuned for a bit of mini lathe goodness. Quick little FYI, folks, just something I've noticed here. I'm starting to set up the, the lead screw for the saddle, and I just thought I'd run a tap into the holes here that uh, that he used to mount the lead screw back on with and I thought gee they're on a wicked angle which I've come across quite a bit of that on the machine so far a lot of the uh, threaded holes are far from being straight you might say now I don't know how well the camera is going to pick it up I'll just zoom down a look at this but that's how far out of out of whack that uh, that hole is be a little bit better over there to see, but yeah, it's uh, it's nowhere near square, so it appears that quite a bit of freehand work has been done on the mini lathe. Now, don't get me wrong, folks, I'm not a man that shies away from a bit of freehand work, if you know what I mean, but it's got to be done properly, and that ain't done properly. Pretty much goes along with the theme for the rest of the machine though, doesn't it? Just general sloppy workmanship. Anyway, just thought you might like to see that. I've just finished mounting the lead screw. The mounting block on this end is fixed. The mounting block on this end is slightly slotted to allow you about a millimetre, mill and a half movement up and down. I assume this end being slotted is so that you can adjust it precisely off the lathe bed to match the fixed position on this end. So I've done that. I've um, I've got this end properly adjusted so that the lead screw is completely parallel with the lathe bed. Now that has once again highlighted another issue. In the initial teardown video, I noticed that engaging the half nuts would bend the lead screw slightly upwards uh, you can see it actually deflecting in the video and I mentioned that that is what's going on now in the process of machining the saddle down I assumed that that would correct that uh, that situation I didn't measure how much the deflection was or uh, how much room we had to move it to fix that but the situation I have now is the opposite we've come down so far that engaging the half nuts is actually forcing the lead screw down so it's a problem that we have to remedy it's not too big a deal, it's quite easy to fix. I'll reposition the camera so that we're looking into the uh, half nut lead screw engagement area and we'll take a bit of a look at it. So here we are looking into the engagement and you can see that there is no clearance on the top. The half nut, the top half nut is actually resting against the lead screw and we have a substantial gap underneath and when the half nut is engaged you can see that the lead screw is actually being pulled down by the top half nut uh, as the lower half nut tries to engage. I've got a 3mm drill bit here and I can actually slide that 3mm drill bit into the recess in the bottom there and that gives me a good indication of um, how much difference we have there. So that's the gap. 3mm. So what are we going to do about it? I think the easiest way to correct this problem uh, is to machine the underside of the saddle. Uh, so I might start by taking a mill, just over a mill, out from the underside of the saddle here in this position and just refit it, see what it looks like and uh, get a more accurate measurement because uh, I think there's possibly still a little bit of pressure being applied by the top half nut. So I'll get it to a point where it's clear and I can take an accurate measurement. The other way to approach this would be to take a millimeter or so off the top of the carriage instead of the underside of the saddle. Either way, they, they both achieve the same outcome in the end. So I'll, I'll pull all this back apart, uh, throw the saddle back in the mill, take a bit out of here, reset it up and have a bit of a look. It's probably a little bit of a mistake on my behalf. I should have checked the half nut to lead screw clearance before adjusting the location of the carriage rack uh, on the lathe bed. but. We'll see there, there is a little bit of play in the engagement there still. It wasn't 
hard up against it. I'm just concerned whether this is going to actually cre now create a binding problem between the pinion drive gear and the rack on the lathe bed. All I can do is start machining it and we'll just see what happens. If I have to relocate the rack again, that's not a big problem. Uh, there is plenty of area to move the rack backwards and forwards, up and down, without running into the same holes. It's really not that big a deal. It's just more work, unfortunately. Something I should have uh, looked at before I actually did that. But live and learn. We all make mistakes, even here in the Aussie Shed. Alrighty then. I've just finished correcting the half nut to lead screw engagement misalignment. Wasn't too bad. A little bit more involved than I initially thought it would be. But... As you can see here, very nice. No deflection in the lead screw, full engagement. Works very, very well. I'll even demonstrate it moving. I'll just attach a cordless drill onto this end. Half nuts engaged, and here we go. All the clearances are now correct in relation to this section of the mini lathe. It all finished up quite good. I'll just shoot the camera into that area again so we can have a look how how nicely that's been corrected. So that's the shot looking back into the lead screw half nut engagement area again. As you can see, we have the same amount of clearance top and bottom. And when the half nut is engaged, the lead screw isn't pressured in either direction. It just sits there quite neutral and engages absolutely perfectly. Overall, well worth sorting out. So what did it take to get it right? Well, there were a few things. As I said initially, when the problem became apparent, I was going to machine the underside of the saddle, which I have done. I ended up taking about 1.4 millimeters, I think, out of the underside of the saddle. I also had to re-clearance where the handle drive gear that drives the pinion gear along the rack here, where it protrudes up into the underside of the saddle. I had to knock about another mil and a half out of that roughly as well, uh, because it only had only just had clearance after the first time I, I cleared it. And I also had to cut a slight recess into the front plate uh, that goes under the way there because the, uh, the pinion drive gear, there was like a quarter of a millimetre clearance there before and by moving the carriage up closer, it closed up that gap. So I've had to uh, knock out a little piece there. I'll just pull the saddle off and show you exactly what I've done. So this is the, uh, the groove here that coincides with the pinion drive gear on the carriage. And this is the recess. This whole area is actually being recessed down uh, another millimetre and then another half a millimetre taken right out of the crown of the where the wheel engages in the top. Because as I say, we've taken a millimetre and a half off this face here. It's just closed up that clearance between the top of this gear and the underside of this recess in here. So those two minor modifications were made to allow for the amount that we've come down plus this little bit of clearance work done there for the uh, pinion drive gear. The carriage rack that is mounted to the lathe bed did have to be moved again. I had to move that from its lowered position uh, back up to almost the original height. I think it's down about half a mil. Uh, I re-drilled and re-tapped it uh, because as I mentioned earlier, two of the holes were misaligned from the factory. So I thought I might as well take the opportunity to once again redo them. So now we have good mesh between the rack and pinion and perfect alignment with the half nuts on the carriage lead screw. All in all, it's, it's very good now. We have the carriage lead screw is running perfectly parallel to the lathe bed. All of these misaligned areas, some from the factory, others which were from the adjusting components, which uh, had to be done. And I knew all along whatever the resulting uh, issues that they created 
uh, were things I would have to deal with as they presented themselves. As it was just a matter of prioritizing the things that needed to be done and then de and dealing with these small fine tuning issues later on as they appeared. I've been fiddling around with this lead screw nut on the cross slide. Uh, you can probably tell there, I have a shim stack under there of about 1.5 millimeters. I have drilled out the threads and re-tapped it from M4 to M5 and I now have M5 bolts running in down through the top. I haven't put the grub screw back in yet which uh, forms the fulcrum to allow you to pivot the lead screw nut if you need to to get a bit of slop out of it. Uh, I don't need to at this point it's, uh, and plus as you'll see in a second I'll show you what the go is with the way the alignment is set up with this from the factory. I'll just slip it on and give you a bit of a look. This is the issue here folks, a little bit of a struggle to get light and the camera in there. You can see that the lead screw nut is almost touching the bottom of the recess on the saddle, like a quarter of a millimetre there. Now I'll show you why that's an issue when we look in through the front. Oh, it's just really really hard to tell here. You'll have to trust me on this. The lead screw nut is actually still high of centre line in the hole that's been bored through the saddle to take the lead screw. Uh, it's probably about oh, probably half a mil high, still half a mil to a mil high, which means the, the cross slide lead screw is going to be running on a slight angle. And the closer the cross slide is adjusted towards the operator, the steeper that angle gets. Now it's not too bad, like it's a very it's a very low angle, but it is uh, an angle nonetheless, and uh, it's something that you don't really want because it means where the face of the lead screw bears against the front surface of the saddle, uh, it will be on a slight angle and it will be touching on one area because of the tilt. So without these spaces in there, without this 1.5 mil shim stack that angle actually increases further. The problem uh, becomes more evident, it's obvious to see when you look through the lead screw hole in the saddle. Uh, so it needs to be taken down as much as possible. You can see when they've made the lead screw nut, they've actually shaved it down as much on that side as they possibly could without going into the threads uh, to give you some movement Realistically, the saddle should be thicker to give you more room for clearance inside of this of this recess to be able to uh, tilt the lead screw nut if that is what they propose you do. So you can imagine you've got 1.5 mil there is the total clearance between the lead screw nut and the bottom of the recess. Uh, so that is your entire scope to be able to tilt the lead screw nut to be able to adjust backlash on there, which yeah, it's, it's enough. But once again, it's already on a bad angle and tilting it is just going to make it worse. Uh, it's just a really piss poor solution to a design flaw that they should have sorted out a long time ago. Anyhow, I just thought I'd show you that and explain why I've done that. And uh, I guess I'll just have to see how it uh, shapes up in the future. I have had the cross slide here assembled and it all seems to function quite well. I'll, uh, I'll just throw the cross slide back on and I'll talk about a couple of other things. Oh, by the way, one thing I did notice, I cleaned up the bottom of these holes because when I put the 5mm uh, the bolts in, they weren't quite deep enough. And I had a look at the holes and the countersink area had actually been drilled with a normal twist drill. So the shoulder that the, uh, that the head of the bolt sits on was uh, on an angle. That's just, I don't know, that's just really, really crap. So I just went into them with an end mill and created a flat shoulder on the bottom and took them down to the right height, but just another typical thing that you find, like recess, recess is done just with a twist drill, like that's just shit. Anyhow, back to the cross slide. While working on the cross slide, I decided to add a few more screws into the side of the Gibbs screw to stiffen it up a bit. There were only initially uh, three screws in here, which leaves quite a large gap between them, which I really feel would allow for movement if the cross slide is out at a point where, say, the front edge is resting in between the Gibbs screw positions. 
there's really nothing behind the gib screw and the gib screw in these things is is super tiny so i honestly think any force could actually twist and bend it at that point where there's nothing behind the gib screw so i've added in a whole heap more screws along here it's something that i that i did see a while ago on a steve jordan video so not my idea but absolutely something that i approve of doing and uh, at the same time, I'm following his move of adding in some locking screws that aren't set with a lock nut to adjust the gib screw, but are purely there just to lock the cross side in position. Now, the screws that I have here, just something I, they're just something that I dug out of the drawer. And now they're too long for the purpose. Now, and I'll just show you my technique for uh, shortening these little screws and putting a, and putting a sort of a blunt point on them all right you can see the end of this has a little bit of a point on it it's just been cleaned up and a bit of a rough point now the way I do that is firstly cut the screw down to the right size that you want then I mount it in a cordless drill with a nut on it to center it and then just run it on the belt sander. I'll just go and cut the other one down and I'll give you a demonstration of, of the technique that I use to just create uh, even points on things such as this that are quite fiddly to hold on to. So there it is, cut to the right length, just with a hacksaw. So what I've done is put a washer and a nut on there. And what I'm gonna do is mount this into a cordless drill. And the purpose of the washer is so that it sits flat against the end of the jaws of the chuck and will actually center the end of the screw without with it with just trying to clamp it onto the head of the screw it's very hard to get the alignment of the end right so that when you turn the thing on it just does crazy wobblies but this technique it seems to work for me anyway to uh, center the screws nicely and allow you to put it into a cordless drill to then be able to uh, put it on some sort of a you know sander grinder whatever you're going to use to shape it with i'll mount it in the chuck and i'll give you a little look so yeah, just, just push it in and just sit the washer flat hard against the, uh, against the jaws of the chuck. I'll just go off camera and tighten this up. And that is how it will sit in there. And as you can see, it's not perfect, but it certainly will spin it better than I can with my fingers, being that something so small. We'll go over the belt sander and have a bit of a look. So here we are at the belt sander. This is the belt sander that I rebuilt in the previous videos. It's only had a few minor changes since I finished the uh, video series on it. Uh, one of them is it's had a few uh, warning labels attached to it just to keep unskilled hands away from the machine in the Aussie shed. But I'll, uh, I'll turn it on and I'll, I'll just throw this up against the belt and show you how simple it is. So it's going to probably get a little bit noisy. I'll probably just turn the the audio down in the video. I'll see how noisy it sounds uh, when I do the editing, but uh, it's just a simple process of running the belt, turning the drill on high in the opposite rotation the way the belt's going, and you can just shape it into whatever you want and it comes out spot on. I'll turn it on and we'll have a look. even little cone shape not too bad I can just throw this other adjusting screw in there now and what that does obviously it just allows you to um, a couple of points where you can actually lock the slide up uh, at any time if you're not using it very useful thanks Steve I might just pop the compound on and point out a couple of things. One more quick thing I noticed about the cross slide is, is this movement here, which will present itself as backlash. Now, what the situation is, and I'll just disassemble this and show you. I'll just bring the camera in a bit closer. So you can see here, this ring, which is part of the shaft of the cross slide lead screw, um, it pushes up against the outside 
of the uh, of the lead screw hole. So when you wind the cross side, it's forced in that direction one way, and then in the other direction, there's a recess in the back of this spacer here that that moves into. Now, the problem is the recess in here is too deep by the amount of play that is in the cross slide uh, when you move it. So this hole needs to be um, shimmed to reduce the amount of backlash that's present when you change direction of the lead screw. Uh, it's another thing that I'll take care of with final assembly. I'll, uh, I'll, make up a, I'll make up a shim or a spacer that sits in behind this that, uh, that reduces that, that backlash to a, a manageable amount. The compound, there it is, in all its horridness. It's a bit of a shocker really. I'll take you over to my surface plate and I'll give you a bit of a look. All right, this is the base for the compound and it's not flat on the bottom, like just about everything that's come off the machine, it has a slight twist in it. Um, and you can hear, I don't know if you'll be able to pick this up with the sound, Okay, that's the sound. I'll, just, I'll tap it with something. Okay, that's a solid corner. Don't know if you can hear the difference there. But there is a rock in these two corners. So it's sitting, it's currently sitting on these two corners here. I'll zoom right in. You can actually see it when I rock it. There we go. Are we going to focus? Oh, no. Seems to be about the best we can muster. Let's see if I can make this something that you can see on the camera. I'll turn him around a bit. Not sure if the audio for the camera is going to pick that up, but you can hear it rocking. It's uh, it's quite not flat, and these corners no problem at all. So that obviously needs a bit of work. Here we go. That points it out. You can just hear it ringing. So it's good, and then it's just ringing. So that's got a rock in it. Now the actual compound slide itself, same situation. You can actually hear that. <laughs> I'll zoom back a bit. All right. So. the difference there it's just ringing that one's ringing but it's not so obvious on the audio and that's solid so it's sitting on these two corners you can actually hear it rock when it's sitting on those corners so so the compound obviously needs some work at this point I'm possibly going to get the scraper out I'm probably better off scraping rather than lapping just due to how the setup is um, and I may even go back over uh, some of the cross slide components and scrape those as well. Now that I know where I am with all those bits, um, everything is roughly where it should be in relation to its location and how it mates to everything else. I've actually had the cross slide on the surface plate and it's pretty good. Um, I haven't marked it up and checked it to that extent yet, but there's no rock in it and it feels really good. So. Um, yeah, at this point, I don't think there's any way around it. I'm going to have to scrape these. Anyway, there's still other little bits and pieces going on um, in the meanwhile. So that's something I will definitely be getting to, uh, if not on next week's video, possibly in the week after. This is a gib strip out of the compound. You can see how uh, inaccurately these uh, locating holes have been drilled in the side of it. Um, you can see this one's actually 
come through the bottom there. They're basically all on a different line. That one's roughly center. This one's really low. That one's low, not as low as the as the uh, the center one, but still low. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but she's got a big wolf in her. I'll just put it down here on the surface plate, and uh, you can I'll zoom up on that. See how much that's moving. She just spins like a helicopter. It's uh, she's absolutely shitful. And uh, of course, it's bent that way, and it's also bent in the other direction as well. Um, when you bend something that much, it will also make it bow. Um, 90 degrees off from the bend so she's just terrible you can see the rocking it that way and that way is just absolutely ridiculous so yeah gib strip needs a lot of work as shit as it is it's actually better than the gib strip in the cross slide started out so um, i should be able to Hopefully tune it up, we'll see. I'll just attempt to straighten it and see how it goes. Gib strip in the cross slide turned out okay. Took a, took a bit of work, but uh, it did turn out pretty good. I'll make the same modification here on the side of the compound here to hold the uh, gib strip in. It only has three screws. I'll, um, I'll probably, I may put one right at, right at each end and then uh, go in the center of these as well. I may put another four adjusting screws in there. I don't know. I'll suss it out as I go, but as you can see, there is still lots to do. So there it is. That's about all we've got time for this week. The Chinese mini lathe. The gift that just keeps giving. As always, thanks for stopping by the Aussie Shed. Cheers.